from stories of hotels, security guards, old cabins, and more. Tonight we have a number of stories, all with different terrors to share. A huge thank you to tonight's writers. Remember to send in your story if you'd like to have it featured. Stories can either be submitted at my subreddit, r slash slumber reads, or the email you can find in the description. Be sure to drop a like if you enjoy. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated. Stay safe out there, enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'm writing this as I'm being watched, so forgive me for not telling you the exact story of how I got my, until this month, very mundane job, and forgive me for my grammar errors because I might be killed at any moment, and I'm typing this as fast as possible. I work security at a theme park that's currently under construction. My job, simply put, was to sit in my booth and scan people's ID badges to let them in and out. My booth was a wooden square with three windows, and a door with a smaller window. The door had a locking mechanism made of wood, but it could be unlocked and open from both sides. Occasionally, I had to tell a visitor that the park isn't open yet, and instruct them to do a U-turn. The most exciting thing to happen before these events was someone not stopping at the booth, and me blowing an air horn to get them to turn around. So, it's simple, easy work that I had been doing for three or four months. That all changed two weeks ago. I work night shifts on the weekends, and I honestly enjoy them. Being alone in an empty construction site is creepy, but also invigorating in a weird way, as if part of me is excited at the idea of something scary happening. Looking back, I really overestimated how fun dealing with paranormal shit would be. It all started when my boss came to visit me Saturday night, about an hour before my shift ended. I had never met him in person before, so we chit-chatted for a bit. I cleared up why I was bringing a pillow to the night shift. It was a cushion because this chair isn't comfortable. And he told me about how we got into security work. Apparently the insurance package was too good to pass up, and it covered laser surgery to fix his eyes. Before he left, he told me that if I was a fan of ghost stories or the paranormal, he had time to share one. He added that, if you believe in ghosts, this probably isn't the best site for you. I laughed and said I was still on the fence. He chuckled as well. He told me he was only asking because there was an incident that happened 15 years ago on this site, and he wanted to know if I was interested in that sort of thing. I was. He gave me the summarized version, which goes something like this. 15 years ago, this spot was a residential area, only a few houses though, mostly dilapidated, but one was still in good condition and had people living in it. The person living inside was somewhat of a recluse, but not so much as to be considered a hermit. He went and bought groceries like everyone else, but you wouldn't ever see him dining out or socializing. Well, the reason he didn't go out much was so that he could make sure people didn't trespass on his property, as he had a nice collection of corpse parts that he didn't want disturbed. Nine and a half bodies worth, to be precise. Nobody could find the legs of the last one, all scattered across his fields and forest, torn apart, as if he worked in a butcher's shop. Eventually he was caught, house, and contents were torched, as he went up in flames with them. Happy endings, am I right? Now, let me take a moment and pause to say something. Whatever the fuck is outside my booth right now. I might know what it is. I do know what it isn't, though. And that's the absolute terrifying part. It isn't that nutjob murderer. It isn't his ghost. It isn't even the goddamn victim's ghost. It's a shape-shifting monster. Not a spirit. It's not human. Although sometimes it looks like one. On pausing. After that night, I started thinking about paranormal stuff more and came to a conclusion. I like getting scared. I may act like I hate scary things, but that's a lie. I crave being terrified in the rush that comes with it. I hunger for it. So naturally, I started reading a lot of scary stories while at work. Plenty of time on this subreddit, as a matter of fact. I prefer the ones involving security guards since I can really immerse myself in those. Having the same job and all. But that's besides the point. However, there's one kind of story I won't read. 
And this is where my problems start in. Wendigo stories. I don't mess with those stories. A year or two back, I was on an Ask Reddit thread, and someone mentioned that in the myth, lore, and fable, or whatever it is, the Wendigo is from. One of its powers, I guess, is that. Thinking about it draws them to you. Bonus points for speaking about them. I closed the thread and went to bed after reading that. I did my best to forget I read it. The idea that being scared of something attracts to you really messes with me. I don't like it one bit. I am afraid of the Wendigo. I don't want to be afraid of the Wendigo because knowing that fear attracts them makes me more afraid. My fuck up begins here. I liked that rush from fear. I liked it a lot. Too much in hindsight. So what happens when you take a newfound addiction to fear, a phobia of Wendigos, and the power to find people that are afraid of you? Apparently this. I first noticed it last weekend. I was working a Saturday night shift, like usual. Things were winding down, and I had just finished reading another story about skinwalkers. The site manager clocked out. I keyed him out, and I put my feet up on my desk and prepared to relax for the next six hours. I messed around on my phone, played with the Game Boy I brought, and occasionally glanced out a window. Sometimes if I focus hard enough, I can almost imagine those things lurking in the trees. And I got a little rush out of that, similar to the one from reading scary stories. An hour or two passed, and I was getting tired. I glanced out my side window, and my heart froze. My whole body froze. My mind froze. Every perceivable sense I had stopped. And in two seconds, the following sequence of thoughts rushed through me. Point two seconds, there was something by the tree line. Point four, someone by the tree line. Point six, a five foot two naked yellow someone. Point eight, people don't have claws for fingers. One, something is by the tree line. One point two, it's just standing there. One point three. My light is on the booth. 1.6. It's not moving. 2. It sees me. I watched it as it watched me. Eventually it scuttled back into the woods. I looked at it for a total of maybe 3 seconds, but I will never forget its appearance. It was 5 foot 2 with sickly, yellow skin that sagged near its waist and joints. It had long fingers that were essentially claws, almost like a rake. And its face was the most horrifying part. A twisted amalgamation of flesh and would look to be leather or hide. At the time, I thought I was hallucinating. Sleep deprivation combined with reading all these stories is a perfectly reasonable explanation for that. And even now, I still agree with that sentiment. Even with that in mind, I made sure the door was locked and turned off my external floodlights along with my indoor light. For context, there were bright spotlights outside my booth on each side so that I could see cars when they approach at night. There is a light in my booth so that the drivers can see me. These lights also illuminate the edge of the tree line, which is how I saw that thing. I didn't see it again that night. I wish I had, because maybe then I would have stopped reading those stories, and it would have left me alone. Sunday night is when I gave it enough attention and fear to attack me. The night began like the prior one. People clocked out, and I keyed them out, etc., Desk, phone, so on and so forth. But I made a mistake that night. The same one as the night before. But this time, I wasn't getting a second chance. I read another Wendigo story. And I think that story really made me afraid enough to eat or murder by that thing's standards. And once you hit that point, there is no turning back. You can't stop being afraid of it once you know it's after you. Anyways, so I read the story and relaxed. Played with my Game Boy a bit. Glanced out the window occasionally. My shift starts at 10 p.m. and ends at 6 a.m. And two hours went by smoothly. 2.17 a.m. arrives. And with it a scream. I can't describe this sound. The closest thing to it is a woman except, instead of human sounds, is the sound of fork scraping a plate. So a woman that speaks and screams in that noise. So I hear that and I do two things. One, I pee a little. Two, I look out the window. In all the stories you and I read, the creature always starts slow, right? Lurks about, approaches bit by bit, 
stands there menacingly before running at you. Not this time. When I looked out the window, it wasn't by the tree line. No, it wasn't even by the field in between. It was mid-sprint towards my booth and was about 50 feet away. It wasn't stupid. It waited to scream until it was between me and my car. It wanted me to know it was there, but it didn't want me to get away. First thing I did after seeing this was slam my chair into the wall behind me and bang my head on it by accident. Second thing I did was grab the meg light on the wall. And the third thing I did was grab the air horn. A second or two after grabbing the horn, it slammed into my window and I quickly turned around. I had been preparing myself to get maybe one swing in with the meg light before being torn to shreds. But I froze again like the night before. It was gone. And where it previously stood was my boss with a very, very angry expression. He just witnessed me have a hallucination and mental breakdown. He gestured to open the window, and thinking he wanted to speak, I reached for the latch, and I paused. Something wasn't right. He had glasses on. My boss wears glasses in all of his company photos, but when we spoke a few weeks ago, he didn't have them on. He said he has had his vision corrected with laser surgery during the spring, so why was he wearing glasses right now? And more importantly, why was he wearing our winter uniform in August? I gestured at him to wait, and pretended to grab a notebook while I tried to sneak a glance at the wall he was facing. Nothing of note except a picture, which I had to suppress a scream after seeing. It was a picture detailing what to do in case of an accident, taken last winter after a truck had tipped over. And in the picture, my boss was speaking to a worried looking contractor in front of an ice patch with a caution sign, and he was wearing our winter uniform with glasses. That wasn't my boss outside. That was the monster. Suppressing every natural instinct, I set my notebook down calmly, turned to the window where my boss stood, and smiled warmly. I set my meg light down, and in one smooth motion I opened the window, pointed the air horn directly at the creature, and squeezed the trigger. This did three things. One, hurt my ears. Two, hurt its ears. Three, woke up some people in the nearby residential area. Within seconds, it unhinged its jaw and screamed, and I had to drop the air horn and shut the window. It ran off into the forest, and I hid under my desk after flipping the breaker switch to shut off all the lights in my security area. After a few minutes went by, I got a call on the company phone from my boss. Apparently, someone called the police to report the sounds they heard, and they sent two squad cars and expected to arrive in 10 minutes. I told my boss what I saw. And he told me that I could take the week off, and they would have me at a new site next weekend. He assured me that it was probably just a homeless person with mental issues, and hung up. That brings me to today. They moved me to a new site, as promised. The creature followed me. It senses my fear, and it won't rest until it has me. My first day, or night, on the new site began smoothly. I arrived at 10, and was pleasantly surprised to meet my partner. They told me he had the night off, and would be there tomorrow night, but I was happy to have the company on my first shift. He gave me the tour of the facility which was some sort of factory for chips. He started with the security room, which was just a small room with a single window. Inside the room were some monitors displaying camera footage, a landline phone, and a panic button that alerted emergency services. There were three main sections not including the security room, food production, packaging, storage. Food production was machinery that made the chips themselves. Packaging was where they were bagged, and storage was where pallets of them were kept in stacks reaching the ceiling, and maze-like pathways through them to navigate. The factory had been closed due to the virus for a while, and planned to reopen in a few weeks. I learned my partner's name was Gregory, and he told me he would take the first patrol. Things went smoothly for a few hours, with us alternating patrols. And then it happened. The beginning of the mess I find myself in as I type this. It was 3 a.m., only a few hours until the morning guard would come to relieve us. Greg went out on patrol while I watched the monitors. As minutes passed, I watched as Gregory entered the storage area. He would probably be there for 10 or so minutes before returning to the room so that I could do my patrol. I was snapped out of my boredom when the phone on the wall started ringing. I picked it up, and my boss was on the other line. Hey, I know it's your first day back on the job since that incident, 
but we really need you to cover the day shift there as well. The guard that was supposed to come in went missing. His wife says last she saw him, he was on his way to work for the Saturday day shift. Hasn't been seen since. I asked him if Gregory could possibly cover it alone since I had plans, and his answer is where everything became horrifyingly clear. I just told you that the morning guard can't make it. Gregory is missing. You'll need to cover him. Panicking? I told him that Gregory was my partner for this night. You're not supposed to have a partner tonight. I put you down as solo. Gregory was going to work a 16 hour tomorrow to show you the ropes when you came in for the Sunday night shift. You're doing fine it seems. Just sit tight and we'll relieve you tomorrow night. I screamed into the phone. Some inner part of me knowing that if I didn't tell him now, I would never get another chance. Someone is on the site with me, and they said they were Gregory. As the line went done, I checked the cameras. Gregory, or the thing pretending to be him, had cut the phone lines and was staring into the camera. This facility had a no cell phone policy, so I left mine in the car. I had fallen right into its trap. I was alone, with no way out and no way to call for help. As I watched the camera, Gregory slowly shifted into that yellow monstrosity that attacked me at my old site. I sealed the door to the security room and barricaded myself in with my chair and desk. I cried. I bawled my eyes out. I didn't want to die. I saw him slice another wire, and the air conditioning stopped working. That creature wasn't strong enough to break down the door, but it was smart enough to plan around it. Within seconds, a smell of rot and decay filled the room, and I looked up to the vent. I pulled it open and found a severed arm inside the ducts. No doubt the rest of its body was further in there. I knew where the real Gregory was, at least. Hours went by. I was in a standoff with that creature. I was safe in the room, but it was getting hotter and smelled worse. The night shift had long since ended, and I guess my boss assumed I was fine since I was supposed to work the day shift anyway. My only hope was to last until night so that the next guard might find me and be able to help. I weighed in and weighed in, and became delirious from the heat and stench. I was hungry as well. I hadn't eaten for over a day. I bit my fingernails, an old habit that I thought I had kicked. And that brings me to know, I was just so hungry. I don't know what possessed me to do it. I ate the hand, and it just looked so good, and I was so hungry. I ate Gregory's hand. And finally I was full. I've been stuck in here since 10 p.m. Saturday, and it's now 9.58 p.m. Sunday. After I ate the hand, the creature stopped staring at the camera. It came to the door and tapped at it. I looked at the camera and watched as it left the facility. Just like that. Gone. Gone like the rest of Gregory. I was still hungry after the hand, so I ate the rest. Figured I'd save them the trouble of cleaning it up. The night shift guard is here now and I think I'm safe, so I don't need to write anymore. I'm still hungry though. I'll show this guy around and then get a bite to eat. I think I forgot to clean the blood off of my uniform. This guard smells really good. Really afraid. Working as the night auditor at a popular hotel chain, I was fortunate enough to meet many interesting people. It seemed as though the insomniacs who would leave their room at night looking for some company were always the most interesting of people. In my time there, I learned that everyone has a story to tell, and this one in particular, I can never forget. There was an older woman, most likely in her late 60s. She was a retired nurse at the psychiatric institution downtown. Each night she was at the hotel, she would come down to talk to me at the same time, 3.25 a.m. I was always grateful to see her, not only for the amazing stories she had to share, but also it was around that time when I was struggling to stay awake the most. Most nights she would tell me stories about her children or grandchildren, and occasionally she would tell me about past work experiences. Some of her patients were still at the institution so she was required by law to leave out any identifying details. One night, she had come down. She appeared to be disturbed by something. At this point, I had been talking to her for about a month, as her house had flooded and she was placed in our hotel until the repairs could be made. I asked her, what's wrong? She hesitated, 
dazing off into the distance for a few seconds. I could tell she was being haunted by whatever happened to her that day. She eventually came to, then turned to me and said, Let me tell you about an old patient of mine. I replied, sure thing, and then made us a fresh pot of coffee. It was a common practice of ours to move to the lobby couches, where it was much more comfortable. We would stay up together, drinking coffee until it was time for me to get breakfast ready for the other guests, and then she would head back to her room to try and get some rest. There was a man who was transferred to my ward shortly after I started working there. Most days he was very polite, and you couldn't even tell there was something wrong. We each took a sip of our coffee and she continued. That man passed away last week. I offered her my condolences, then she added. When I said, most days, there were times where he would leave these fits of uncontrollable rage. He would spout, while kicking and screaming, seemingly nonsensical phrases, and we would have to restrain and issue sedatives to calm him down. She had never told me anything like this before, and I was intrigued to say the very least. And she said, today, while I was at the store, I heard his voice from behind me saying the usual nonsense, black car, oak tree, yellow jacket. When I turned around, I only caught a glimpse of him in the corner of my eye before he disappeared. I thought nothing of it and continued shopping. When I finished and began loading the groceries in my car, a man wearing a yellow jacket driving a black Camaro stopped next to me and asked where the nearest gas station was. Remembering my former patient's words from before, I was spooked a little bit, but brushed it off as a coincidence. I gave the man his directions, and he went on his way. Several minutes later, I had finished loading the groceries into my vehicle and started back to the hotel. Traffic was horrendous the entire way. As I was inching my way down the street, I saw police zoom past me. Shortly after, a fire truck, an ambulance. As I approached the source of the traffic jam, I was horrified. The man from earlier appeared to have lost control of his vehicle and crashed into a tree. An oak tree, to be exact. I remember not really knowing what to think about what she told me. I muttered, maybe it was all just a coincidence. She smirked, sensing my empathy before finally agreeing. Perhaps. Before we knew it, the alarm I had set for myself to get breakfast ready had sounded. She then took her coffee and headed back to her room for the night. A day or two went by and she appeared to have accepted the events that took place as coincidence and moved on with her life. That was until the following Friday, the last time I would speak to her before my work week was through. When she came down, she had the same horrified look on her face. We sat down, got coffee, and began to converse as we usually did. She was quick to tell me, I was in my room watching TV this morning when I swore I heard his voice again. The voice screamed in the same frantic delusional tone that he once did in the ward. FedEx. Six. Cul-de-sac. I then sprung from my bed, searched my entire room and found nothing. As I went to turn off the TV, I saw a glimpse of the man on the patio. I started towards the door leading outside, and before I got to it, he was gone. At this point, I was just as startled as she was, because I knew what she was going to say next. As I was eating my dinner and watching the news... I saw a story of a shooting in Houston. It was a FedEx employee seeking revenge on his ex-wife. This man managed to execute six of her family in his pursuit, but was caught before he could find out where she was. The news showed the man's vehicle surrounded by police in a neighborhood cul-de-sac. I had seen the story earlier that night on the lobby TV, as I would spend most of the night watching the news to pass the time. I didn't know what to say. I sat there waiting for her to speak again and she just went up to her room early that night. I was concerned for her well-being because, at this point, I saw her as a mother figure to me. After my shift was over, I spent most of the weekend trying to figure out what was going on with that poor woman. I remember thinking, is she just senile? Surely she's just making this up. Despite thinking this, I had not known her to tell a lie. She was always so genuine when she spoke. I looked forward to returning to work to see how she was. On Monday, she didn't come down like she usually did. I checked our guest list to see if she was still checked in, and sure enough, she was. Assuming she needed space, and understandably so, I let her be. She didn't come down again until that Thursday, when she had yet another encounter with the man who haunted her. This time, she didn't tell me what she had seen or heard. She just tried to make small talk, 
and forget about what was going on in her life. I was worried for her, but I respected she wanted her privacy, and I carried on with the meaningless banter that night. Before she went back to her room, I told her, I'm worried about you, you know. I'm always here if you need to talk. She turned to me with a half smile and said, I know you are, and thank you for listening. The next day when I came in for work, the previous front desk clerk had informed me that the guest in room 406 had checked out earlier that day. I was shocked. I couldn't understand why she would leave without telling me. Her insurance company had booked her for another three weeks. I thought, where would she go? That night, as I was walking the halls to keep active so I wouldn't doze off, I noticed a piece of paper on the floor by the elevators. I picked it up to throw it away when I noticed it had the woman's handwriting on it. The sloppy nature of the note led me to believe that it was written in a hurry. This concerned me. As I started to fear for her safety, the note read, Iron horse, clear water, field of flowers. I thought it was strange that she had taken the time to write this down, and that whatever these words meant caused enough panic in her to make her want to leave. Several weeks had passed and the strange happenings involving the old woman had all but left my mind. That was until I went on a family outing with my daughter, downtown. On our way to the park, we passed by the mental institution. I never noticed the horse statue that sat in the lobby before. It was at that moment I remember the notes I found that night. I spent the rest of the day looking for something that could have coincided with the words on the note. But I found nothing. The next day I drove to that institution and took a look around for myself. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon an empty room with a painting on the door. Depicted in this painting was a beautiful field of white flowers at sunset. I asked the nurse who used to be in this room, and she said it had been empty for a couple of months now. She said that the last person to have occupied that room was a delusional schizophrenic who passed away. Now the room is used for storage. I then asked if it was okay if I took a look inside. She obliged, and I walked in. The only thing left in the room were some old boxes labeled decorations and furniture that had all been stacked neatly against the wall. As I walked closer, I noticed there had been something scratched into the wood paneling behind one of the boxes. From the looks of it, this carving must have been there for years. It read, One day you will discover the truth. This was quite different from the phrases I was used to hearing from the old woman, but I assumed it had to be from the same man she had spoken of. Strangely, I felt this message was meant for me. I couldn't explain it. Feeling dissatisfied with what I had discovered and not getting any closure on the issue, I returned to my apartment. The complex in which I resided overlooked a small lake, and I would frequently take walks there to gather my thoughts. That evening I did just that, and I was the only one there. As I was overlooking the clear waters, it hit me. I was where I was supposed to be for the final words of the notes I found. This made me feel uneasy, and I decided to return home. That's when I heard a crazed man's voice. I'm having a lot of trouble trying to make sense of the events that happened in the past week. I'm not looking for answers, because answers would make the insanity real. If this was just down to me being crazy, then this would all make sense. God, I wish I was crazy. I love my dad so much. I idolized that man growing up. All kids had their favorite hero growing up. Mine was my dad. No matter what got him down in life, he still always managed to have a smile on his face for me. That's why I can't get my head around it. Or maybe I don't want to make sense of it. My mother, who is also a lovely woman, a real sweetheart. You could say I'm a mommy's boy at heart. I noticed she started getting worried about my dad. I heard her talking on the phone with my grandmother about him coming home late with no real excuse for where he's been, and a strange odor coming from his clothes. I was getting a sense my poor mother thought he was cheating on her with someone. I knew for sure that couldn't be the case. Not my dad. For my mother's sake, I decided to confront him. I didn't want to flat out accuse him of being a complete asshole. I just wanted to know what he was up to after work. My mother was in the kitchen doing dinner when I noticed the time on the clock. My dad should have been home an hour ago, and he's never late for dinner. My mother and I sat and ate our dinner without him. I didn't want to embarrass my mother by telling her I knew what was going on. 
We just sat and watched as she picked her food and stared at the clock. Long after I had cleaned up, my dad came nervously through the back door. He glanced at me a nervous smile before disappearing down into the basement, which was really out of character for him. I wasn't letting this go. I was getting to the bottom of this no matter what. I crept slowly down the basement steps and began to get that smell my mother was talking about. The smell was hard to describe, but it smelled like the crusty old sock behind my bed that my mother is afraid to pick up, and the musty odor that only comes from an old folks home. When I got to the end of the steps, I could hear my dad sobbing uncontrollably, begging someone for forgiveness. I reached the end step, forgetting about the noise it made when you stood on it, alerting my dad to my presence. I didn't know what to expect. That glaring, bright smile he only kept for me was now replaced with a hate-filled, dead stare. He bore his teeth at me like a rabid dog growling before he made a run for me. He was too quick for me to react and before I knew it, he had me by the throat, lifting me off the ground. He squeezed so hard I could feel the veins in my eyes bulge. I tried hitting him in the face to try and break free from him, but the more I struggled, the harder his grip got. I used the last of the air in my lungs, begging him to let me go. As he held me, he looked down at the phone in his other hand. I could swear I could hear someone laughing loudly on the other end, and without warning, my dad just dropped me. I lay on the ground holding my neck, too scared and confused to do anything. My dad just looked at me, before slithering back into the dark corner of the basement, sobbing down the phone begging someone for forgiveness. That night I was in my room crying and trying to get my head around what just happened. I didn't want to tell my mother and upset her more. I have never in my life seen my dad get violent in any way. That wasn't my dad down in the basement. I was scared for my mother, who had to share a bed with him that night. What if he tries to hurt my mother? So many thoughts were running through my head. As I sat there, I suddenly heard a knock on the door. I nervously ask who it is when my dad pops his head in the door. He has a big smile on his face and tells me good night as if nothing had happened. The next day I planned to skip school and follow my dad to work. I sat in a coffee shop across from the building my dad worked in, waiting for him to finish. I sat there, and I was praying my dad was cheating. I was praying whatever the answer was, it was something that made sense. It was getting late, and it wouldn't be long until my dad left to go home like he was supposed to. As he left the office, he was on the phone with that same disturbed look he had on his face down in the basement. He looked at his watch as he went in the direction away from where we lived. I had no choice but to follow him, but I wasn't sure I was ready for what I could find. He was on the phone the whole time I followed him. I followed for about an hour until we came to this old rundown house on the edge of town. I thought about my mother being distraught about the idea of my dad cheating on her as he walked up to the front door. I couldn't see anyone answer the door before my dad seemingly let himself in. It was now or never. I decided there and then that I was going to confront him in the act. He wouldn't be able to talk himself out of it, and if he attacked me this time, I was ready for him. I walked up to the front and knocked as hard as I could. I kept on knocking, but no one would answer. The thoughts of my dad hiding inside the house angered me. I moved around the back to see if a back door was opened. I glanced something out of the corner of my eye as I passed one of the windows. I crept up to the window to have a look. To my complete shock, it was my dad sitting on a chair looking horrified and sobbing uncontrollably. The room was large and empty, and it was just my dad in the chair. I tried banging on the window, but he just ignored me. I could see he was looking at something. Whatever it was, he seemed terrified by it. I couldn't understand why he didn't get up and run. He wasn't tied to the chair or bound in any way. The only thing different about him was his bare feet. As I screamed for him to move, I suddenly see what my dad was looking at. It crawled across the floor towards my den. It moved unnaturally as it dragged itself slowly across the floor. Long hair covered its skeletal, naked body. It kept moving towards my dad. He looked so scared as it edged itself closer to him. The closer it got, the more my dad cried. I tried breaking the window, but the rocks just bounced off in. It was inches from my dad. My dad seemed resigned to his fate as the creature stopped at his feet. The creature's bony fingers began searching the ground, sniffing around until it found what it was looking for. I don't think there are words to describe what happened next. The creature started licking my dad's feet. My dad wasn't scared or horrified anymore. 
He was laughing uncontrollably as the creature's long, slimy snake-like tongue slithered all over my dad's feet. My dad was laughing so much he started sweating like he couldn't control it. The more the creature licked, the more my dad laughed. He began pissing himself as the laughing became too much. I thought my dad was going to laugh himself to death. As I stood there helpless, I noticed someone else was in the room. They seemed to be telling whatever it was on the floor what to do. They got in a frenzy, the more my dad laughed. I couldn't get a good look at who it was. They looked small, like a child, but old and creepy at the same time. I couldn't hear what was going on, but something caught their attention. And a small girl walks into the room. The little person seemed scared of her and backed away into a corner. She walked over to my dad and began collecting his tears. I couldn't understand why my dad just sat there, laughing his fucking head off while surrounded by crazy people. I was trying to come up with a plan to free my dad when I got a familiar smell. The same smell I got off my dad down in the basement. Before I could turn to see where the smell was coming from, something hit me in the head and I wake up a few hours later still outside the house. It was getting bright and my head was pounding. Did I just experience some crazy acid trip or was what I saw real? The house was empty as if no one had stepped foot in it. All I could think about was my dad and if he was okay. When I got home, my dad wasn't there. My mom was in the kitchen distraught that my dad never came home. When I told her about following him to a house, it just made her worse. I didn't want to upset her anymore so I left her at it. I went upstairs to lay down for a while. The blow to the head was making me tired and I just needed to rest. I woke up and it was dark out. I must have been asleep for hours. I was surprised my mother never called me. The kitchen light was on and I could hear something moving about. As I made my way down the stairs, I started to get that terrible smell again. At first, I thought it was my dad, so I ran to see if he was alright. The smell was pungent, but it wasn't coming from my dad. It was my mother, and she was huddled in the corner sobbing uncontrollably down the phone, begging whoever was laughing on the other end of the phone for forgiveness. I've lived in Alaska my entire life. I live in one of the more populated parts of the state. I won't fully disclose it for my safety, though I've seen a lot of things, and I'm not even very old. I've seen damn near everything Alaska had to offer, well I thought I had anyway. Turns out, cryptids are a lot more angry up here. We have the classic Sasquatch, otter people, dogmen, serpents, our own version of the boogeyman, Wendigos, and even skinwalkers, believe it or not. I've had the displeasure of being hunted by two of these. Take a wild guess. It started when I was at my friend's house. I was sitting at the ridge on the border of their property. Where we sat had a trail leading up and a light pole. It was around 11 at night, but Alaska's winter gets dark. We were sat under the yellow light from the pole when I heard a branch snap and snow crunch. I assumed it was a moose, so I told my friend to keep their eye out. They nodded, and we continued to talk. A few minutes later, the snow crunched again and I felt my heart freeze. Now, I'm a pretty paranoid person, but this was well before it had really taken effect. I'm still unsure which of the two cryptids it was, but it had infrasound. Infrasound is something big cats and other predators use to activate a prey's fight or flight, usually ending up in the prey freezing. According to whatever the predator was, I was its next meal. I grabbed my friend by the hood when I stood up and ran down the trail, pulling them along with me. They groaned in protest and confusion until I told them something was wrong. We ended up going inside that night, and I didn't get a wink of sleep. I was too afraid of what was waiting outside. Fast forward to a few months later. It was July. I was sat with my window open and writing on my computer. I was home alone as I often am. But that didn't bother me. As I typed on my laptop, I felt something strange. That intense feeling of being watched. I tried to ignore it, but it overtook my body. I looked out the window to the edge of my driveway, next to the pond, and there it stood. A pale gray, malnourished, disgusting looking creature. Sunken in eyes, slightly protruding teeth, and on all fours nonetheless. Though, this creature had a human-like body. Aside from the twisted appendages, 
I froze in my spot when it caught my eye. I shoved my computer away from me and got up to crank in my window. Once my window started moving, so did it. Inching closer to my home with lanky, broken looking legs. I wound my window up enough, flipped the lock and pulled down my curtain. That was the first night I had ever spent cowering in my bathtub with a pocket knife and a blanket. I hadn't seen the creature again until later in the year, winter. I was taking the garbage down to the end of the driveway when I heard the inhuman growling. It sounded like a dog had smoked 20 packs a day and tried to growl at me. I wasn't taking any chances and sprinted up to my porch, slamming open my door and locking every lock. My mom looked mortified, as was I. This happened on a few separate occasions, but this wasn't even all of it. I would walk to the bus stop in the mornings, so obviously this could be an issue. One morning, my cat, Fergus, had followed me down to the bus stop. I was petting him as I stood next to a stop sign. Now, Fergus is the sweetest cat I'd ever met. He didn't bat an eye at dogs, moose, other cats, nothing. He was a badass and a sweetheart and one cat. Imagine my surprise when he spun around, arched his back, and started hissing and spluttering. I was horrified. This beefed up Maine Coon cat was hissing into the darkness at 6 in the morning. Thankfully, the bus had come to my aid, and I got in immediately. Fergus passed away recently, so I'm a little nervous about not having that warning next time. Now these next few experiences all happen in the span of a week. It started with me sitting in my living room watching some show when I heard something on the porch. This was before I had a security system so I couldn't really see it. There's a small, obscure window at the top of my door, but I'm just shy of tall enough to see out of it, so I had to go by sound. I slowly crept around my house, making sure each door and window was locked up. I hurried my dog into my parents' room and into the bathroom. He likes hiding in the shower so he didn't really mind, though. When he started snarling, which he never does, I almost started sobbing. The layout of my parents' room as you walk in, there's their bed, two windows on either side of the bed, and the bathroom next to one of the windows. My mom puts the spare mattress we had up in front of that window. I hadn't locked it. I frantically dialed up my mom's number and called her quietly while hugging my dog. I was crying. She ended up coming home a few minutes later when she went to get me out of her bathroom. There were scratch marks on the wall. Something had tried to get in. This was when my paranoia spell started. I would frequently have episodes of pure, irrational fear, usually ending up in me sleeping in my bathroom. A few times, like this one, it was warranted. I was once again sitting in my living room watching a show when I heard something in the carport. The wall behind me was the one connecting to said carport. I got up, walked closer to the TV and turned it down. Listening to each thudding step of the thing outside, I began to shake and spiral into a panic attack. It slammed on one of the walls and I booked it to my bathroom. I locked myself inside with my knife, phone, and charger. I wasn't prepared to hear it behind me, through the wall to my backyard. The only way to get in is to hop the fence, unhinge the door, or crawl over the massive boxes blocking the back porch. I didn't care which it had done, but I was mortified nonetheless. This thing had definitely known where I was in the house. Eventually, it stopped and must have left. So I left the cramped room to check on my dog. He was fine, though shaken. The last time I had seen it had by far been the worst. I haven't had near as close of an experience since. I was on a Discord call with my friends, eating food and chilling in my kitchen. I was having a good time when I had the overwhelming feeling I was being watched. I knew exactly what it was. So I looked down to the bottom corner of my back door. My back door has a wide window encompassing pretty much the entirety of it, with a curtain that it came with. Peeking out from a sliver of room, the curtain left. It was sunken in eyes, gray skin. It was staring up at me. I grabbed my phone and ran to the bathroom for safety once more. After not hearing it for a while and having my friends call me down, I went to my room. I knew the window was locked and closed. I felt a little bit safer there. Boy, was I wrong. I had been halfway asleep when I heard ungodly scratching at my window. I was obviously confused and scared at the sound. When I peeled back my curtain, I was faced with that ungodly thing, with its fingers protruding through the window. 
I dropped the curtain and ran to my parents' room into the crawl space in their closet, knowing this thing couldn't find me there. I had closed the door to the room itself and the closet on my way in when I heard the mattress blocking my parents' window fall, careening onto their bed. With terrible scratching and snarling, I heard my dog going crazy outside the door. This disgusting thing was stalking around my parents' room looking for me. I heard each deliberate step, each gruff and breath of air. I was frozen on the ladder of the crawl space. I hadn't even turned the light on, which would be my saving grace. I heard the closet door whine as it was opened. This thing could open doors. It sniffed around my parents' clothes. I heard it step on the slab of wood, keeping me hidden. I don't know how it didn't find me. Maybe it was the smell of the carpet, but it eventually booked it and left. I stayed down there almost the entirety of the night until I heard my mom come home. That was the last time she left me home alone late at night, especially during winter. I was busy working all the time, and the stress was getting to me. I decided to take a break from it all and get a hotel room for the week. I check in, and an old lady shows me to my room. The hotel was very old looking, but it was quite nice. I settle in, and decided to get some sleep. In the middle of the night, I heard my door rattle, but didn't make anything of it and went back to sleep. I wake up, and I realize I'm locked in. As I bang on the door for someone to let me out, I hear footsteps, but no one lets me out. I look through the peephole and I see another eye on the other side. I jump back and hear footsteps again. I look through and see an old creepy lady walking by. I realize that I am stuck and no one can help me. The hotel room looks like a mini apartment. I see a very old bed with a dresser next to it and an old styled lamp on the other side. A bookshelf that's kind of messy with a hamper next to it. A mirror on a wall with a table underneath it. As I start to try and find my way out, I make my way to the table that's under the mirror. I looked all around and I saw something in the vase on the table. It's a page that looks like it's been ripped out of a journal. It says, If you are reading this, that means that something bad has happened. I will try and help you get out, but as I'm writing this, I do not know if I will make it to the end. I wish you well, and please listen to what I'm about to say, as what you do next will be life or death. As I finish reading, I turn the page to the other side as the first page was already filled. As I was trying to read it, it looked like the ink had ran out while they were trying to help. All I could make out was, under the bed, box in the bookshelf. The last thing I see is, hamper. I make my way to the bed. I look under the bed, but nothing was there. I thought I might have read it wrong, so I looked at the paper again. I don't see or read anything different, but I decide to look under the bed mattress. There I find a key. I then made my way to the bookshelf. I looked through all the books to find the box. I found a beautiful old looking jewelry box. The jewelry box was a tiny little oval box that had blue, yellow, pink, and purple jewels on it. I found a keyhole and put the key in it. I opened it and I found another key inside of it. I started looking at the hamper next to it but didn't find anything. I started taking out the clothes in the hamper, which were not mine. I didn't find anything and decided to look on the back of the hamper. I see a tiny little door on the wall. I open the door with the key I got from the jewelry box. When I opened the tiny door, there was a key and a compass. As I was looking at the compass, I realized that it wasn't pointing the right way. The arrow kept pointing at the mirror on the wall for some reason. I look at the mirror, and I see a keyhole on one side. I open it. It was really old, so it creaked when I opened it. I see a huge room inside the mirror, and I start to climb into it. As I was climbing in, I heard the doorknob enter into my room start to rattle. I turn back and see the old woman at the doorway. She started to run at me, but not like an old woman should. She was very fast. I scream and kick her away with my foot as I get into the mirror and shut up behind me. I look and see a huge room, but it's different. The room was empty and dark. The only thing in it was a bunch of mannequins that were all on a track. They all had school uniforms on and books in their hands. I see something on the wall and I go to it. I see a piece of paper. The paper says, I hope you made it this far. We're close to being done. Please listen to what I say because you need to understand how deadly it could be if you don't. There are four boxes on the ground if you didn't already see them. 
You have to get the right books into the right boxes so you can get out. I look down and see the four boxes and each one is a different color. There is a red, blue, green, and black box. I continue to read what the page says. You need to find the box that are the same colors as the boxes and put the right color book in the right box. Now here's what's hard. If you pick the wrong book, or even touch a book that isn't any of the colors, the mannequins will slowly start to move around the tracks. Do not look them in the eye. Do not make any noise. Good luck. I make my way around and find a red book and pick it up. I slowly make my way back and put the book in the red box. I get the green one and the blue one too. As I was trying to find the black book, I accidentally said to myself out loud, Where is this book at? I hear ticking sounds and I look around. The mannequins start moving around slowly. One bumps into me and I scream. Something came out of them, like a sword was sticking out of them. I panic and see the mannequin holding the black book. I try to make my way over when one of the mannequins cuts my shoulder with the sword sticking out of it. I screamed in pain and they started moving faster again. I get to the black book and grab it from the mannequin's hand as I run to the boxes and put it in. The mannequins all stop moving. Then a door that looks like the wall opened up. I start hearing ticking and look behind me. All of the mannequins are moving towards me. I run and shut the door behind me, entering the next room. I look around, and it looks like a school hallway. I walk around and there are doors on the walls, and the hallway is a big circle that wraps around. I see a piece of paper on the ground and I pick it up. It says, This is the last room. This is a very easy one, if you do as I say. In about five minutes, that old lady will come in here and start looking for you. You need to hide. She will start walking around banging on doors and screaming. Wait a couple of minutes. She will think you didn't make it from the last room. If you don't get found, she will leave through one of the doors and forget to lock it behind her. That's the door you need to leave by. Once you get out, you're going to bolt it out of the messed up hotel. I start to hear a door rattle. I try to find a hiding spot and hide in the locker. I hear footsteps. I try to stay quiet. I start hearing banging and screaming saying, Come out, I know you're in here. At this point I was freaking out and tried to stop myself from crying. After waiting for what felt like a lifetime, I heard a door open and shut. I wait a couple minutes, then I leave the locker. I tried to open a couple of doors and found one that opened. I ran out of that room and found the stairs. I ran down flights of stairs out the door. And I came straight here. This is the conversation between me and a police officer. The police officer. So you're saying that an old lady at a hotel tried to kill you? Yeah, I... And you say that you had to go through escape rooms to get out? Well, basically, yeah. Okay, you sound drunk. I'm not drunk. I'm telling you the truth. Go and see for yourself. We ended up going back to the hotel, but it was all abandoned. And there was graffiti all over. Hardly any signs of it ever being a hotel. I don't understand how it happened, and I still don't to this day. It's been a couple years now, but I know I'm not lying. I have a scar on my shoulder from that mannequin. Safe to say I'm never going to a hotel again. I've always been a rowdy kid, and being me I naturally had to do one of those stereotypical teen parties when I was younger. It had the whole package, alcohol, people pairing off, and several illegal substances. And just as stereotypically my parents found out. To say they were livid would be an understatement. However, my father had just the way to punish me. He told me to go upstairs and pack the things for the summer. No electronics, though. I complied, and we drove ten hours to a cabin in the middle of nowhere. You like it? He asked. Uh, sure. Good. I was going to get it fixed up by professionals, but seeing they'll have to be fixing our house, this is what you'll be doing for the summer. I'll be staying in that shed over there. You'll have the cabin. Your first task will be to clean it up, then I'll supervise the renovations. I went inside and plopped down on the mattress on the floor. It was a fitting punishment, but not one I was especially looking forward to. The first few days were fine, nothing that out of the ordinary. The place was dirtier than you would think possible and a lot of the previous owner's stuff was still tucked away in boxes. I wasn't allowed to leave the cabin for two weeks when we drop all this crap off at Goodwill. 
So in the meantime, I mostly just swept and scrubbed the place and pushed stuff further into the reaches of the attic. Dad had checked me off to be done for the day, so I sat sifting through the stuff in the basement. It was also incredibly boring. There was a desk in the corner of the room. I'd probably need to clear out its drawers so I could move it tomorrow. I pulled on the drawer only to find that two side drawers were false and instead opened like a door. The back was a different color compared to the rest of the desk so I reached in my hand and pushed. The false back opened away like it was nothing. I rushed to grab a flashlight. When I shined it in, I could see a passageway. Only the first few feet or so were illuminated. It appeared there were stairs. I crawled through the desk opening and into the passage, which, when you got past the entrance, it was tall enough for me to stand. I started slowly walking down the stairs. Every ten steps or so there would be a landing. On the sides of each landing there would be a door. One on the left and one on the right. Each was marked with a number. I passed dozens of these. All were locked, and even if they weren't, no way was I going in one. The place was clean, sterile, almost like a hospital ward. I could see there was wiring and the place was either air conditioned or so far underground that, like a cave, it could maintain a decent temperature. I don't know exactly how long I was waiting for, just that it was a while. It was completely silent except for the sound of my footsteps. I listened in on a few of the doors, but nothing seemed to be going on. The doors had no light showing through their cracks. There wasn't any. All of a sudden the light snapped on. My chest felt tight. I looked everywhere. I could hear footsteps coming up from where the stairs bent out of sight. I ran, not daring to look back. I swear I could hear footsteps and lights turning on behind the doors. I finally made it to the desk and crawled through and replaced the false back. Then I stacked every piece of furniture I could find against that thing. My dad was in town buying groceries, but the house had a landline, which I knew was working. I dialed the police and ran to hide in the shed. Two hours later, because this place was in the middle of nowhere, and apparently there was a huge fire in town, so they were already busy, the police finally show up. When they went to search the place, they found hundreds of rooms, each appearing much like a studio apartment. Everything had been left behind. Well, almost everything. Anything we could trace back to who these people were was gone. No credit cards, no ID documents, not even any religious books, just coffee cups and rugs. The police searched the remaining area, and when my dad finally got back, we packed up our things and went back home. Mom was terrified, of course, and we decided to just have the property demolished and sold. It's been almost three years now, but yesterday I got an envelope in the mail. It had pictures of me, mostly during my time at the cabin, but a few were more recent. There was one of me at my new apartment that was taken from outside the window. There was one of me biking to class, obviously zoomed in. There were a few of me at the grocery store. There were pictures of my parents, even me on a date with my ex-girlfriend. Each was marked with a date and the names of the people in the picture. There must have been hundreds, each of me or my family in some capacity. I even had pictures of my estranged grandparents, who I've never met. And the final was of me sleeping, taken from inside the apartment. I think the people from the cabin are pissed. I think... This is a threat. First of all, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. I'm male, 20 years old, and not from the US. I want to excuse myself if I have any spelling mistakes, because English is not my first language. Anyway, this incident occurred 8 years ago. I was 12 at the time. For background, my mom had just bought me a cell phone to communicate better. I had to attend school as usual. Class time was from 12pm until 6pm. So I just organized my bag with everything I needed for class and put my brand new cell phone in my pocket. It was 4pm and all of a sudden another teacher, Sarah, told our class group that the next teacher wasn't at school because he was sick. So we had no class with him. She asked if we wanted to go home or just play football until our parents arrived for us. We all agreed on leaving early. I left school and called my mom, who was working. I told her we didn't have class so we could leave early. As soon as I was walking the street, I noticed a weird man who was staring at me a few meters away. It was strange because he had some cutlass or machete on him. I just ignored him. 
I didn't think he was going to harass me or anything like that. I arrive home. I check for the keys, which I didn't have on me. I decided to call my mom again because I couldn't enter. She told me I had to wait until she arrived, which would be in 30 to 40 minutes. So I decided to wait in front of my house. A few minutes pass by, and then appears the same man who was staring at me. He was following me. I was freaked out and scared. This man had a machete and a gun. He showed me all of it. I couldn't speak or move anywhere. He started yelling at me. I remember he told me, give me your things or your life. I will kill you. I obviously gave him my phone, my notebooks, and my bag. I'd prefer to lose material things than my own life. The man left. It was a complete shocking moment. I didn't know what to do. I just stood completely in shock. I started to cry. Then a neighbor noticed me and asked me what happened. She took me to her house until my mom arrived. I told my neighbor everything. So she called the police. My mom finally arrives. My neighbor has a conversation with her. The police arrived too. They asked me a lot of things that I found confusing. After they went with my mom, I don't know what happened next. I live in constant paranoia as a result of that day's events.